And our scripture reading is from the book of John, chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. And before I begin, I just want to, um, I'm going to take your picture because, because I can and because I love you. And it's just for me to remember what a privilege it is to stand here before you. Oh, and I also want to let you all know that Frank Walter is not here. We all know his pew is empty today. And that is because he is babysitting our 14-month-old grandchild. And um, she's sobbing right now because she's scared of him. But it means that I can be here with you. And also, I'm dressed the way I am because I'm going to be after this going over to the Van Vlack Gardens to do a short service in memory of Sharon Carlson. It had to be small and intimate, but I wanted you to know that I'm wearing a stole that's just festooned with flowers in her memory. So this is kind of like my, my get up today. Okay, so here is this reading. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. This is God's word. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we live in one foot, one foot in your kingdom and one foot in the world's kingdom. Help us on hearing your word preached today through the power of your Holy Spirit. Get straight which foot to pick up and put over in the other kingdom. And we ask that in your son's name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I also want to say hi to the people that are joining us online. Not sure where you are, but I'm going to look this way and say, hi. <laughs> hi, people. So maybe it's COVID. Maybe it's that I'm getting older. But I am, I've been reflecting a lot on the state of the world. And I can hear my grandmother's words echoing in my ear. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. And I used to look at her and go, well, what's your problem? The world is a wonderful place. You know, my world is nice and safe. But as I've grown older and seen more, I realized, I realized that, yeah, that's true in some levels, but the world is also a place filled with great suffering, great evil, great brokenness. Certainly, I've been troubled as I watch in the news the rise all over the world of authoritarian leaders. It's just something that's really been bothering me. These people that somehow gain control over the lives of others. At the same time, we hear voices long silenced, crying out in a way that people who want to maintain the status quo are being forced to hear. And that's causing a lot of division and struggle. But mainly what I see in the world that troubles me the most is how quick we all are to judge first and maybe show mercy after. And that's, that's, a, that's a pretty sobering view of our world. And like my grandmother, I might say, well, the world's definitely gotten worse in my lifetime. But I don't think that's true. 
Because I think that the world that Jesus was born into was just the same. Jesus came into a world that was controlled by authoritarian leaders who had the literal power of life and death over them. There were crowds of oppressed people crying out all the time. But it was a world where they could expect really only justice and very little mercy. And into this world, Jesus came to show mercy. And yet, he, in this text, now faces two of the most powerful leaders in his world, the religious leaders and Pilate. And I would imagine at this stage, Jesus probably knows not to expect a lot of mercy from either one of these, whomever decides his fate. So the religious leaders are very interested in maintaining the status quo. They are upset because Jesus is creating problems that are gonna call the Romans' attention to them and they're worried they'll lose their power and worse, the Romans will just come wipe them out. Pilate is the governor of Judea and he is the emperor's representative and his job is to keep the peace. So he's worried about who is this person? who I'm hearing about, and I need to figure out like what to do with him. But they both really have the power of life and death over Jesus at this point. And it's honestly, it's a very strange passage. Like if this was all you read in the Bible, you would just close the book and scratch your head because it's just like two people that are talking past each other, which actually sounds a lot like a lot of conversations we have today. But, you know, Pilate asks, Jesus a question. I mean, Pilate really wants to know, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus really answers him with a question. Well, like, who have you been talking to? Are you talking to some of those people I healed? Or are you talking to those religious leaders? Pilate answers <laughs> with another question. Um, yeah, what have you done? He just wants to get, you know, cut to the chase. And Jesus doesn't answer what he's done. Jesus answers with a statement, my kingdom. And Jesus basically says, and this is the message translation, which I really like. He says, my kingdom is not the world's kind of kingdom, Pilate. My kingdom doesn't consist in what you can see around you with your eyes. My kingdom is not like yours. And so, Jesus is talking about the kingdom. So Pilate's like, okay, okay, you're a king, right? And Jesus completely ignores Pilate and basically just says, everybody who believes why I've come, believes the truth about my kingdom, they're going to be the ones who hear. This passage has caused me to carry around the question, what in the world is the kingdom of God? I live in fear that people on the outside of our faith will ask me either about the Trinity or what is the kingdom of God? Because honestly, I'm like, how long do you have? It's really, really hard for us to grasp and explain and even figure out for ourselves, what is this kingdom that Jesus is talking about? So, We know the word has Jesus spoken parables, right? So, you know, we might tell somebody, well, Jesus said it's like, uh, you know, you find a treasure in a field. It's so spectacular. You want to rush and go buy that field so you can possess the treasure. Or it's like a pearl of great price. Or it's like a tiny, tiny little seed that grows up into a huge bush. Or it's like yeast that when you work it into the dough, all of the dough is transformed. But that doesn't really tell us much. Jesus, and I preached on this a couple of weeks ago, told one of the religious leaders, if you love God, love neighbor, and love yourself, the kingdom's come closer. So that that gives us another clue about what Jesus is talking about. But the real problem comes by how Jesus uh, embodies 
that you don't enter, enter this kingdom. You don't rule in this kingdom through power. Jesus enters his kingdom through powerlessness. And none of us can enter this kingdom wielding anything that looks like human worldly power. And if that's not confusing enough, Jesus told his followers and he tells us to be in the world and not of it, not to be conformed to this world. And so what are we supposed to do with that? It's really hard to find um, theologians write all kinds of things about the kingdom of God and make your head spin and it'll put you to sleep. But I did find something and I wonder if you've heard this before. But it's as good of an analogy as I have heard about how do we, how can we understand and grasp in our own minds what we're doing here, why Jesus has tasked us with building the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So many of you know, I'm sure there's some history buffs here. Frank was here. He could stand up and give you an hour lecture on this topic. But in the, towards the end of um, World War II, everybody knows about D-Day. Some of you have been to Normandy. But on that day, the Western Allies crashed onto the shore of Normandy and engaged in and won a decisive battle against the German forces. But it was quite some time before they traveled through the country pursuing the fleeing German army, liberating villages, liberating towns, liberating concentration camps before they got to the time when Hitler committed suicide and eventually victory was declared. And so some theologians offer this picture for us to see what it means to live in this in-between. See, that's the problem. Jesus is tasking us to live in this in-between space, between this victory that Jesus won when he died, when he was resurrected, when he ascended into heaven, and this ultimate completion when Jesus comes again. And, you know, I think Christians... I hear Christians concerned with this in different ways. I mean, some people just want to be raptured up. You know, we have left behind. And it's just like, it must make Jesus so sad because that's so not what the point is. The kingdom is here and it's coming. It has come and it is coming. And it's a lot like saying the war is over, but it's not over. But that's what happened between D-Day and V-Day. And so I want to offer that to you as a way to try and fathom this strange space that we are living in and will live in until Jesus comes again and what we are to be doing in that time. Jesus said to his disciples, I am going away and I am coming to you. He said that in one sentence. You can imagine that made their head spin. But I'm going to take a step over because we know now what Jesus meant when he said that. But the disciples at the time didn't understand it all. But this idea that, um, and I, Robin made me make sure to say, I'm not Jesus, but I did like that phrase because I'm going away. I'm going away in my identity as a pastor to you. I won't be doing baptisms and funerals and weddings. And, but I will, I'm coming to you as a, as a fellow sister who cares desperately about the kingdom of God that we're building on this corner in this place. This is our corner of the kingdom. This belongs to us. This is our task. And I've been here long enough to know a lot, and any of you who've been here anytime understand the foundation that has been built in this place by so many who have come before us for over 100 years. This kingdom, the kingdom uh, on this corner is well underway. There is something that has been built that we are now building into on top of. I want to I wanna also encourage us as we build the kingdom on this corner to remain in our reformed tradition, 
Now, a lot of people might say, well, the numbers are really scary. And the truth is that the numbers, you know, the, the, the numbers of people joining the Reformed Church are really dropping. But before we hire a rock band and have a rock concert with Jesus songs, or before we become, you know, uh, silence the entire service like the Quakers, I want to offer you that our Reformed tradition is so, has so much power in it for us to remember how to stay in the kingdom of God, how to stay in this land. One thing is, I bet if I <laughs> asked you to raise your hand right now, would you prefer to keep the creeds or get rid of the creeds? That get rid of the creeds might win out because people just, we start to say them by rote. We, we forget what we're saying. But today, when we say, I believe Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, that not only puts Jesus in our world history, but it provides us a tragic example of a man who might have joined Jesus's kingdom, but instead chose to build his own. And that, that danger is always before us. Do we, do we decide we're just going to build our own wealth, our own kingdom, our own lives? Or are we going to step over and build Jesus's kingdom, the kingdom of God? When we pray, I mean, we just say the Lord's prayer sometimes. I do. Just like, let's get it over with. But we pray, Heavenly Father, thy will be done. You know, that kingdom come. Bring earth to heaven. Sometimes I wish we could change the words of the prayer so that it becomes, we could, we could attach our passion to the words. So we can't let these prayers and these creeds become old hat. We have to keep injecting into them the wonder and the mystery that it's part of the kingdom work that we're here to do. Even today, we're going to share this meal. And what this meal does for us is so much. But two of the most important things, Jesus said, remember me. And living in this world, we can so easily forget Jesus and what Jesus has done. So we come to this table not only to remember the whole story that's in this book, but also we get humbled with our need for spiritual food and a power source outside of ourselves. And that power source is the Holy Spirit. You know, when I first walked, set foot on that red carpet, right there where the narthex joins the aisle, 32 years ago, I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I did not know what it was. And that spirit is in this place, but we have to be dependent on the Spirit's power. It's so tempting for us to switch over and, you know, enter into the worldly ways to wield power. None of us think we're doing it, but we do. I do it. But, but part of our Reformed tradition is really to, to pray for the Spirit's equipping. And, you know, the only thing I will say about the Trinity when people ask me is that the Holy Spirit is the redheaded stepchild of the Trinity. Because people don't know what to, I mean, I didn't grow up with anybody ever talking to me about the Holy Spirit. But now I understand that we are equipped by God to build God's kingdom. And it's the only way to do it, is to do it in God's power. I also just want to um, encourage all of us to be very supportive of Pastor Robin and our session, because I know that they, each one of them, are here for such a time as this. And they're going to lead us to the place of discernment where we'll, we'll go into the future, we'll, we'll hire an installed pastor, we'll figure out the next mission for us on this corner, and we'll keep building the kingdom of God. But we're all just in this process. We're in this in-between. And that's where we're going to be for a long time, so we better get used to it. Because we all want to get somewhere. And until Jesus comes again, we, this is our task. We have to act like what Jesus told Pilate is the truth. So we have to believe it, but then we have to do something 
Okay, and so when we say these creeds, when we share this meal, when we pray, we do it believing that what Jesus said to Pilate was true. And therefore, that is going to that is going to, to to color and empower all of our actions. And it's going to change what we do and how we do it. We were just talking. Uh, Liz is going to play the violin in a minute. Donald's going to play the piano and the organ. Whenever we're doing it unto the Lord, that's what changes it. That's what brings, that's when the, cre- the kingdom breaks in. When we pray with passion, Lord, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It's not that we're summoning up God's power because of our emotion. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that we remember that's what we're doing. That's why we're here. So I think the, the um, I've, I've taken um, some liberty with you, but, but I've been here for 30 years and I think I see a few things. And so as I kind of go and then come back, I want to just encourage you that it's how we go about this kingdom building that's, that's important. Whenever Robin preaches her sermon or Donald plays the organ or Irene and Kim feed the, our mesh neighbors or Val visits someone in, in an assisted living place or, or Jody points to, to Jesus, to a little kid. Um, whenever Liz plays her violin or Pat clerks or Norma sings or any of you, Allison mans the office. I just, what I see is that when we do it unto the Lord, when we do it, believing that what Jesus said to Pilate is true, the kingdom breaks in. And the problem is that it's invisible. And we all like the visual. But that's what Jesus was trying to tell Pilate. You can't see my kingdom by using your eyes. Whenever we incarnate the love and mercy of Jesus Christ, no matter where we are, the kingdom breaks in. And it's what happens, we can't see it, is that we're actually building something invisible but permanent, like a permanent new reality until Jesus comes again. So it's not like all this stuff we're doing isn't doing something. Jesus has given us the opportunity and the empowering to actually build a structure we can't see. And I'm beginning to think I see it a little bit and I want you to see it so that you'll be encouraged and so that you'll continue this amazing privilege of working for the kingdom of God. We are going to, um, we're going to sing a closing hymn. And if you notice, we don't have a rock band up here today. We're not going to be singing contemporary Christian music. Um, We're going to sing a wonderful old hymn um, all hail the power of Jesus' name. And, and th- we're going to actually sing, bring forth the royal diadem, the crown, and crown him Lord of all. And if you remember nothing of this sermon, what I want you to remember is that we only have one life. We only have one crown, and we can only live in one kingdom. And so when we sing that song, I hope, you, like me, are going to remember once again to put that crown on the head of our king and let it stay there. Because that's what I see. But can you? Oh, Lord, give us eyes to see and ears that hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And so help us, sober us about the seductiveness and the power of the world that we live in and help us not be conformed by that power, but instead, Lord, to be conformed by your Holy Spirit. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.